Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1992 Peter Jackson film, Dead Alive. This is probably his most notorious film, and it's beloved by many people, and I think there's a very good reason for that. I think this is a super unique film, and it's not just unique from when it came out. It's actually still unique now, I would argue, especially because if you look to... Um, how good the practical effects were and still are at the moment and not just that but how much of it there is that's the big thing is the sheer volume of practical effects the gore gags at play in this film and it's pretty much consistent from the very beginning of the film to the very end of it there's so much thrown into this that I'm hard-pressed to think about any other films that do this much. I mean, if you can think of it, put it down in the comments. Are there any other films that throw this many gore gags at you that fast and from the beginning to end of the film? I can't really think of that. And that's why this is such a unique film. But not just that, it's all of that and then it's wrapped up in this kind of zany, comedic, cartoonish fun. So even though it's presenting some very horrific things, some very gory things, some crazy things, it's doing it in a very fun and light way, and the music helps with that, obviously, even though the music is, like, super, super hokey, uh, which, you know, Peter Jackson does that. Uh, that that's his thing. Uh, at least early on is what I mean, his very early films. That's how his music was. But, um, yeah, so it's, I mean, it holds up. It definitely holds up. So let me talk a little bit about this, and um, obviously I'm a fan of it. This is, this is... Um, the first time I've watched it in probably over 10 years, which is kind of crazy. And it's it's always fun to go back to a film after it's been that long and be like, this is what I remember of it. And then getting that refresh on it and being like, oh, um, I forgot so much about this film. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say really quick before I go into it more is, um, like I was talking about, you know, the, the sheer volume of all the gore gags, but also the fact that they just keep throwing more and more at you. And it's just like new gore gag, new gore gag, new gore gag. They weren't reusing them. They just kept having all these super creative ideas, ways to kill these zombies, ways to do disgusting things. And that's another big part of the fun of it is seeing what they'll do next. And it also feels like they just keep taking it to the next level, next level, next level, next level, all the way through to the end of the film. So, yeah. So, obviously, this is a Peter Jackson film. He directed it. This was two years before he did the film Heavenly Creatures, which I've seen that film. If you haven't seen it, you got to be okay with a lot of crying, <laughs> It's it's a very different film than Dead Alive. Like they're they're polar opposites pretty much. But the music is very similar, which which is really weird. But yeah, uh, Heavenly Creatures good in its own right, but very different. Um, do just do an experiment and do a Peter Jackson uh, double feature one night and do Dead Alive and then do Heavenly Creatures. Or actually, it's probably better if you do Heavenly Creatures and then Dead Alive because then you finish with something more fun. Just saying. Uh, this was written by Jackson uh, along with Stephen Sinclair, who also wrote scripts for *Meet the Feebles* and *The Lord of the Rings*. Rings, uh, *The Lord of the Rings: The Two Towers*, which was the second of those films, and then Fran Walsh, who wrote scripts for, and this is a lot, *Heavenly Creatures*, *The Frighteners*, which is a really awesome underrated film that Peter Jackson also directed, all *Lord of the Rings* movies, all of the *Lord of the*, all three of the *Lord of the Rings* movies. Uh, also, King Kong, The Lovely Bones, Mortal Engines, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug, and The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. So, Fran Walsh, great writer. And this is why I always talk about writers when I talk about films, because a lot of people know the directors involved with the films, but they don't think about the writers. And the writers are important, obviously. That's where you're getting the dialogue. That's where you're getting the story. You get a lot out of that. So, just, just saying. This film is also known as Brain Dead. That's what it was initially made as in New Zealand, and it's um, it became known as Dead Alive when it came to the United States. So, it had a three million dollar budget, and it only made about two hundred thousand dollars at the box office. Uh, you can see where the three million dollars went. Um, so many effects, so many practical effects. It's insane. Uh, the opening scene, uh, which is Skull Island, is actually shot where they had the shoot for the Path of the Dead for the Return of the King, Lord of the Rings Return of the King. So I thought that was kind of an interesting tie-in to old film of Peter Jackson's newer film. Uh, Bob McCarron did the prosthetics and makeup, 
which phenomenal, amazing, unbelievable. It still holds up, like I said. Uh, and he ended up getting an award at the Sitkiss Catalan International Film Festival and was also nominated for a Saturn Award. I say rightfully so. Did an amazing job. So the park scene, a uh, little backstory. The park scene with the baby, which I think is really funny. It's kind of one of my favorite parts because when he's like beating the piss out of the baby and people are reacting like, oh my God, what is going on? It's just funny. Like that comedic work, I really like. Um, so they ended up actually having some extra money and time at that point because that was the last scene they actually shot. They had like two extra days because they got done early with filming, which... I don't know how you do that with how much work probably went into this and how, how much time it probably had to take to set up all this gore gags. But anyway, they ended up having about two extra days, and so they put a, a, an extra money. So they put extra days and extra money into the park scene uh, to make it more comedic to you know do the best they could with it. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. There are multiple cuts of this film. And one of the reasons for that, the main reason for that being when it went to other countries, each country kind of put their hands on it, did their own cut, you know, cutting out certain gore stuff because there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of gore and different countries feel comfortable with different levels of gore back then and now even. So that's why there's so many different cuts of this. Uh, don't know which cut I saw. So that's the thing. I assume it was the totally uncut one because there was so much stuff, but you know. So Simon Pegg actually cites this film as one of his big inspirations for making Shaun of the Dead, which you can kind of see it in that, uh, and that's not uncommon. I feel like a lot of filmmakers who had grown up and seen Dead Alive, um, that sticks with them. It's it's a film that gets talked about a lot within the horror community when people start thinking, talking about influential horror films or just crazy horror films um, because it's it still sticks out. Like I said, it's still a very unique film to this day. And I don't really think it's been matched for what it is. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting that Simon Pegg found it as an inspiration. And then I started thinking about that and I was like, you know, when you're watching uh, Dead Alive, it's really, um, it seems heavily inspired by Evil Dead, which was 11 years prior to Dead Alive coming out. Um, if you watch it through that light, Lionel, the character of Lionel, is very much Ash Williams. And... Um, yeah, the zombie horde. Like it, and it's kind of the same way. It's like this horror comedy splatter gore. It's it's pretty similar. Uh, there isn't much time wasted on this because you get to the gore pretty much immediately, where the um, the colonialists basically are escaping from Skull Island with the rat monkey. Uh, the guy gets bitten and then they're like, oh, we got to kill him. So they hack him up and they hack him up very graphically, you know, cutting his arms off and everything. So that's important because it sets the tone. It says, you know what? We're going hardcore with the gore. Here it is within the first like minute or so of the film. We're not wasting time. And I appreciate that. And it, it sets the tone. Like, you know what you're going to start getting from the film. You don't know to what degree it goes because it, like I said, it just keeps going level, 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 but you get a little idea. So the shooting style and the characters with this are so unbelievably quirky, which I think is what really keeps the horrific and disgusting stuff from being actually horrific and overly disgusting. Um, when you put the music to it that they did, when you shoot it with the camera work that they, that they shot it with, uh, there's always this like kind of fun playing with the camera where it's kind of like, um, a lot of the shots are kind of askew, so it's it's like these fun, funky angles. And then they do a lot of like a, a real close-up shots, especially with the faces of the characters. And they'll do them at weird angles with the characters' faces. So it gives this kind of almost cartoonish, non-realistic, comedic feel to it, which I find interesting. And like I said, I think it takes some of the edge off of the horrific stuff and the gore. Uh, you get a close-up of those lawnmower blades early on, which is kind of a funny foreshadowing of what's to come. Obviously, the first time you're watching it, you don't know that that's coming in later, but when it does, it's a good time. The rat monkey looks insane in this film, and that's the first like big uh, prosthetics thing that you see that looks good, like practical effects thing that looks really good, is that rat monkey, and when its head's being squashed by Lionel's mother, it's... Long, a longer scene than you would think and that also sets you up for what's gonna end up coming up and saying yeah it's gonna be gross it's gonna focus on the grossness and uh that's a good scene to really set things up 
Uh, I like how the mother's wound ends up being so disgusting when they're kind of dressing it and they take the dressing off. Um, it, it's just this giant wound, and then it's it's like moving and pulsating like it's becoming alive. They have so many great touches to to those types of things in the film. I like how nobody is really ever scared in any of these situations in the film. They're just kind of upset or surprised at worst. So the characters aren't like realistic, but that fits with the mode of the film, with it being kind of like this horror comedy. I'd actually say it's more of like a splatter gore comedy. Is, I mean, for me personally, like that's what it feels like. That's how I would personally categorize it. Um, but yeah, it's just funny because there aren't realistic reactions in this. And I think that's okay. Like a lot of films, that wouldn't be okay. But with this one, with the tone that they set, it's okay. I actually think it works in favor of the film. I don't know why Lionel actually lies to Paquita in this when his mom and the nurse end up getting killed and then he like shoves them in the basement. I don't know why he lies at that point because she was already with him for some pretty crazy stuff. So like that part of the film doesn't make sense. It's kind of odd to me. Um, I don't know. It just, it just seems out of place. I just don't think that should happen. Uh, I love when the guy taps the eyeballs back into his mother's head. Uh, after the embalming went wrong and there's like the embalming fluid like flying out of her, which that amongst many others was a very fun scene. Uh, when he comes in, he just like puts his t fingers on the eyes and then just goes boop and then just pops them back in the sockets. It's just funny. And that's the thing. Like there are these nice little disgustingly comedic moments and they work and they work really well. And like I was saying before, like I can't think of that many films that, that are around that do that and do that well. It's so unique. How the priest's speech lines up with Lionel struggling, struggling with his mother is actually really funny. You know, it's talking about things about their relationship, he and his mother, and they're, they're like fighting and how they'll meet in the afterlife and um, they're already meeting after she's dead. And then he talks about resurrection as they fly through the window right behind him and he says resurrection and she has been resurrected. So that's just good script writing. I like that. Um, another great moment, the quote, I kick ass for the Lord, when the priest just starts doing all these martial arts moves and he's like kicking arms off, kicking legs off. That is also one of my favorite moments. Uh, the park, because of the comedic aspect of it, and I kick ass for the Lord. So funny. Uh, you don't see it coming. That's the other thing about it. You just really don't see it coming. And it's just one of those wacky, over-the-top fun things that gets thrown in there. Lionel just can't get away from having to take care of people. He has to take care of his mother, and he is basically owned by his mother throughout the beginning of this film. And then he's still taking care of his mother, even when she's dead. And then everyone that she turns into a zombie after that. So it's like he has this zombie family that just keeps growing, and his responsibilities just keep growing too. Because he's trying to keep all these things out of society, which, you know, good on him. But what a terrible life. And it's just like he can never get away from his mother until the very end, obviously, which I'll talk about more later. The movie just doesn't stop going to the next level. I wrote down zombie sex, zombie baby. I mean, zombie sex, zombie baby, lawnmower scene, uh, the baby uh, ripping the girl's face open from the inside out, and then the mother, that gigantic, freakish, crazy mother. I mean, it just keeps going and going and going, which is what's great about it, obviously. I laugh when Lionel is beating the piss out of that baby. I already said it. It bears saying again. That zombie baby getting the crap kicked out of it is just funny. And that's good physical acting by that actor, by the way, the guy who played Lionel. When Les throws the party at the house, uh, you know, like, you know immediately this is just a setup to get more bodies to infect more people as zombies, have more to fight, have more disgusting things to do, more gore gags, all that stuff. And you know that's coming, and you're ready. Like, at least that's how I felt. I was like, let's go. Here's more fodder for the zombie situation. Let's do it. Um, I wrote down, yeah, I already talked about it a little bit, but the lawnmower scene seems nuts, and it's fun. But then it's actually upstaged, I think, by the, the face ripping by the baby, actually. Because at that point, you're watching the lawnmower scene, and you're just like, oh my god, this must be the pinnacle. This must be, like, the end. Because it seems like an ending to any other film. But then the face ripping, and then the mother, and it's... It just keeps surprising you. And, the, yeah. 
It's, it's just one up, one up, one up. Uh, trying to shoe, shoehorn in the part about Lionel's mom drowning his dad and his dad's lover. I felt like that was kind of dumb. Uh, we definitely could have done without that. You didn't need it at all. It didn't really add that much to the film. Uh, although in that flashback, I think it's kind of funny with his mother looking younger. Uh, I think she looks like Michael Caine in that scene, which is kind of weird. Tell me if you think that's accurate. Put a comment down there. I mean, at least to me, uh, she looks like Michael Caine in that. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, his mother wouldn't let go of him in life. And in the end, she tries to take him back into her womb. You know, I mean, literally, that's what ends up happening. Well, let me fix this lighting. There we go. That's a little bit better. In the end, she literally opens up her womb and sucks him back in because she knows, I mean, obviously, he's getting away from her at that point. His entire life, he's consumed by his mother, what she wants and what she tells him to do and says, don't do this, don't do that. And this whole thing is has been his way of, you know, going through terrible things in life which finally led him to getting away from his mother and then it's the last ditch, ditch effort that at, at the end to do the ultimate and take him back into the womb that's the ultimate of taking control of his life but obviously he gets away from that um lionel is a meek mama's boy who gets pushed around by everyone until he goes through a drastic for transformation when he goes through the long and hellacious zombie ordeal like I was talking about. Um, that's his journey. And, and that's kind of the main thing. Is it's his journey from being just this like this meek person who gets pushed around to, to someone who becomes a hero. You know, it's very much like Ash in Evil Dead. And uh, I think what, the probably the most defining moment of when you see Lionel start to really become that person he becomes in the end is when he punches Les because Les pushes, pushes Paquita. That's that moment where it all starts going for him. He, he has that kind of snap. Um, the music in this is so zany and over the top and melodramatic. And like I said, it's like that for his Heavenly Creatures film too. Um, if there were any updates to be made to the film, I'd leave the film as is, but I'd probably change the music because the music to me is just, it gets annoying for what it is in my opinion. Uh, although I'm sure there are plenty of people who love it. There's such a hokey cartoony feel to the movie because of the askew camera angles and the movement and how close they get to the characters' faces. I already kind of talked about that, but um, it's a very important aspect of it. it. It's what gives it its overall feel, and it's... I don't know many people who do that. That was done a little bit in Ash vs. Evil Dead. Or, I'm sorry, in Evil Dead. Sorry, I was thinking about the most recent. In Evil Dead, like, it does that too. Sam Raimi did that. So that's another reason of why I was saying in the beginning that it feels to me like Dead Alive is very much inspired by Evil Dead. That'd be a good double feature, by the way. Evil Dead and Dead Alive. Um, the practical effects are the best part of the movie. They look good, and they keep doing creative things with it. I know I already said something about it, but this is another thing that bears repeating, because, man, those practical effects look unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. And like I said, it still holds up, which is nuts. This and The Thing practical effects wise still holding up there's a theme in this that was used a good amount in the 90s and it's it's a quick theme but it's in there uh the colonizer comes into native lands looking for discoveries with no respect for the land then something terrible happens as payback because in the beginning if you remember go back where the colonizers are going to skull island and they're not basically not listening to uh, well, they're not, not respecting the tribe. They're not respecting the land. They're just taking something they don't understand, taking it to the mainland, and bad things happen. Especially in the 90s, there was a lot of that type of stuff going on. Um, situations of, you know, the, the terrible colonizers going into, you know, tribal lands or going into the rainforest or wherever, un uncharted territories for them. And then messing with things and acting like, you know, they should own everything and they're going to take this and they're going to take it back home. And then it just unleashes havoc. Um, that's something that was done a lot. And, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a quick part of the beginning, but that's how we get the entire movie. Like, that's how it starts. So it's kind of a plague of ignorance and a plague of entitlement that comes to Lionel and everyone there because of these people. But anyway, so... This movie is a little bit hard to, to put a rating on because 
I'm just rating it as a film, really. So it's very, very important for horror. And like I, you know, like I keep saying, it's a very unique film. But so um, with the possibility of five stars with half stars in play, I'm not going to go crazy on this film. But I think the practical effects and, and how fun it is and how it just keeps going, going, going makes me need to, to put it at a four star rating. I can't go higher than that. I could certainly go lower than that for certain reasons, but four stars, man, it is, it is a good film. I recommend it to a lot of people. If people are into crazy stuff and horror, Dead Alive is for them. Dead, or al Dead Alive or Brain Dead, however you want to put it. But anyway, thanks for checking this out. I know you have thoughts about this film. Go ahead and put it in the comments uh, and talk about anything else you want is fine. Do me a quick favor. Excuse me. Do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button if you have not. So if you're going to do that or you've already done that, make sure you also hit the notification button, the little bell, because that'll let you know when I put out new videos or when I'm live streaming. Uh, and those live streams are fun. You should jump on those. Those are a good time. Uh, if you've already subscribed, just hit a thumbs up to let me know you're still watching. Uh, but regardless, thanks for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.